um, aneurysm rupture. Um, unfortunately, here I don't have endovascular neurosurgery or endovascular radiology. So aneurysms are something that we try not to do here, but we get the patients through the emergency department. Um, what happens with an aneurysm, it, an aneurysm rupture is a dilatation, and I've got a couple pictures here. It's a dilatation in an artery. It's a dilatation in the artery, and I usually say, have you guys seen a tire where you hit a curve and it does a little bump on the side? The same thing. There's a defect on the wall of the artery and you have a dilatation where the blood is causing some abnormal flow. So the blood flow here, and it's coming from here, there is a dilatation abnormal here, and so what it does, there's turbulence, and the blood flows around there. One, the artery splits open, and it usually happens at the bifurcations. The flow goes through one side, goes to the other, but if there is a defect there, then the artery will have this defect, like this one. Natural history of an aneurysm, we hemorrhage rate, and, and I'm talking about once the patient we know they have a hemorrhage. Um, because statistically, if someone has an aneurysm, it is 1 to 2 percent per year risk of an aneurysm, a small size, and it depends on the size here. Um, risk of a rupture per year with prior, without prior hemorrhage, less than 10 millimeters, 0.05 percent, 5 over 10,000, 10 millimeter to 25 millimeter, 1 percent, greater than 25 percent is 6 percent percent per year. So this is the risk if you have an aneurysm. If the aneurysm ruptured, the patient can rupture again 20%, at least within the first two weeks after the hemorrhage. And it usually happens the first 24 hours. Why? Because this is when the artery is very friable. It's very soft. Um, what happens later, there's scar formation and everything, but usually the first two weeks is the most dangerous. Back then, aneurysm surgery was always done two weeks after the rupture. Why? Because those who died, died then, and those who didn't had better outcomes. But that's not the case anymore. Now we do endovascular. We can treat aneurysms, like if we were doing some coiling, for the, if we were doing endovascular for the heart, like stenting. We go in through the groin and put little coils in the aneurysm and obliterate them. This is a giant aneurysm. This is calcification. This is a CT of the head without contrast. This white stuff is abnormal. If this would be with contrast, we could say, well, this is normal, but this was without contrast. This is blood, blood. This is the cilium fissure. This is a blood inter interhemispheric fissure, frontal lobes, temporal lobes. And this is actually part of the uh, occipital lobe down here. This is the medulla. This is the ventricles here, the temporal horn. So this is the aneurysm right there. This is the wall of the aneurysm. It's very thick and calcified. There's calcium right there. And this is where it's coming from. Um, this is in surgery when we clip these aneurysms. Um, again, this is one of the, the, the harder surgeries to do. And not technically, it's treating these patients. After you clip an aneurysm, you're done with surgery. No. After what happens to these patients, these patients go into vasospasm. That means the arteries start constricting and decreases their flow to their brain. So for these patients, these patients would benefit from endovascular stenting or at least di dilating the arteries that are in spasm. That's why these patients should be in a place where they have endovascular, okay? Um, if there's an emergency, someone's ruptured, they're actively trying to die, then we can do it, but the further management is not optimal here. Vasospasm, and, and again, we don't have many of these patients, but if you see vasospasm, these patients can start, can be doing, can, can start after surgery, start waking up, they're doing great, and then what happens? Mental status changes. Um, first thing you have to rule out is a re-bleed, that the patient have a re-hemorrhage. Because if this is an elective aneurysm that we clip, the patient never bled, we clip the surgery, the patient did well, but two, two days later, the patient starts having spasms, they will have a neurologic deficit. Weakness, numbness, um, they can have a drift, they could uh, getting confused, but you have to be able to differentiate what's the cause of the change. When you have aneurysm surgery and subarachnoid hemorrhage, patients can get hydrocephalus. And I have a topic about hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus overproduction, like over, and uh, I go over, it's not just overproduction, it's the loss of the reabsorption of spinal fluid. And with the blood, it affects the way the blood, the spinal fluid, uh, gets reabsorbed in the brain. 
The other thing is edema. Edema after surgery, it can happen. And, I'll, and last time we had, we, I asked if you guys knew the difference between the types of brain edema. Why in certain patients we can give steroids and why in others we can't. And we've got a couple slides later. A hyponatremia. These patients can go into hyponatremia. This can give you altered mental status. Low sodium, especially less than 125, can cause seizures. So this, in, in these patients, patients can go into hyponatremia. Um, infection, again, they have a ventriculostomy. Hypoxia, you have to rule out with an APG. Patients can also go into seizures after aneurysm surgery. So all this thing can happen after aneurysm surgery. So aneurysm surgery are patients that are very sick. Um, things that can make vasospasm worse. Well, patients who do cocaine or amphetamines, that will increase the risk of vasospasm. And you can even have patients who don't have aneurysms who can go into vasospasms because of amphetamines and cocaine. And then what leads to vasospasms? Brain ischemia. Brain ischemia leads to, you know, and I included here, head injury. Um, a head injury can also cause brain ischemia. That means that there's decreased blood flow and less uh, uh, oxygen consumption of the brain than the blood is reaching to the brain. And again, uh, we talked about uh, CO2 monitors and all that stuff, PCO2 monitors. Yes, they would be very good, but in all patients, they're not really useful. The, the thing you want to do in these patients is to maintain a cerebral perfusion pressure. And here, you know, last time we talked about keeping it 60, but I'm going up to 150 in vasospasm patients. Why? Because you're trying to overcome the stricture of the artery and to get enough blood flow to the brain. Dr. Burke? Yes. Um, you were talking about uh, permissive hypertension in light of that. Would you still let, do that with an aneurysm clipping? Uh, after it's clipped, yes. Not before it's clipped. Before it's clipped, you keep the blood pressure under control. Um, and the question was, do we do hyperperfusion in aneurysms? Until they're clipped, we don't. Because if you start bumping their blood pressures, you're going to make it rupture. Okay. Once the aneurysm is, rupt is clipped, then you can bump up the pressure. Okay. Um, initially, when a patient comes in and unruptured and we haven't taken to surgery, you want to keep them on the normal tensive. You want to use nitrime and cardipine to keep their pressure low. At the same time, you want to keep them in a room that's quiet. You have to make sure they're on stool softeners. You have to make sure that nothing is bothering so they don't bump up the pressure. Quiet room, closed room is always very helpful. Again, this is more about uh, traumatic brain injury. In patients who have traumatic brain injury, the regulation is absent. And so what happens in these patients, they're, they're normally your brain tells your, your body, tells your heart, the arteries, I need more blood. Someone has traumatic brain injury or in vasospasm, your body can't tell you what's happening. And this, for instance, this patient had lost their frontal lobes because no blood flow started going to the frontal lobes. So this is an ischemia of the brain, secondary to TBI, and there's also secondary to vasospasms. Hydrocephalus. Everybody hates these, right? <laughs> In the ICU, these patients are the ones with the ventriculostomies. Again, this is the imbalance between spinal fluid production and the absorption. And if this happens, if any of them is abnormal, for instance, overproduction of spinal fluid, some tumors, coronal plexus tumors can cause this. And the problem with the absorption would be as someone who's got meningitis, who's got hemorrhage, and the blood forms a film and, inter and, and affects the, the system of reabsorbing the, the uh, spinal fluid. Again, uh, I have a little bit of a, if anybody's interested about the physiology and pathophysiology of hydrocephalus, in everybody's brain produces approximately, and I usually quote it, a can of Coca-Cola to 500 cc's a day. That's the normal production of spinal fluid. So, and this is important, when you guys have patients with ventriculostomies, if you start seeing someone producing one liter, two liter, there's something wrong, okay? If someone is producing, if you're draining 50 cc's an hour, 10 cc's an hour, then you can start seeing that there is not enough, there is not enough uh, reabsorption. For instance, uh, again, go back to the comparison. If someone's producing a liter of CSF a day or two, the reabsorption is altered. If someone's producing 10 or 20 an hour, it's not too bad because it won't make that much of a difference. So here is a way we can kind of say, when, when does someone need a shunt? We can start titrating the ventriculostomy catheter. Um, and the way we do it is we start bringing it up to 
20 uh, millimeters of mercury, you start challenging the ventriculostomy. And sometimes we just clamp it and see how they do. Um, when do we do the shunting? And depending on their symptoms and depending on the scans. Um, again, the composition of the fluid is similar to ultrafiltrated plasma. Uh, there should not be cells. Um, there should be about uh, two-thirds of the glucose in, 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 in the CSF compared to the blood. And uh, the ventricular system is, uh, is this. Um, the, the red stuff is the uh, choroid plexus. This is what produces CSF. And the choroid plexus looks like little fingers uh, in, under a microscope. It looks like coral, actually. And this produces spinal fluid. This is the temporal horn, occipital horn, lateral horn, foramen of Monroe. This is the third ventricle. Okay? And then down here is the aqueduct. And here is Luska, Jandi. And then this is the fourth ventricle. And then there's a, something called a central canal. In the spinal cord, there's a little opening that uh, spinal fluid can get down there, but that's not really as accurate as how this fluid moves around here. And what happens here, after it reaches here, the spinal fluid goes around, and up here on top of the brain, there's some granulations, pachyonal granulations. That's where the spinal fluid is reabsorbed. So it's produced here and reabsorbed next to the veins. And, and what happens is that these, these are modified veins that water can go through and it goes through the venous system. And, and again, the, the arachnoid granulations can absorb several times more than what they can reduce. Again, things that can affect it, trauma, infection, obstructed by blood. Um, and everybody uses this term, communicating non-communicating hydrocephalus. Well, if we're talking about communicating and non-communicating. If if I block it here, then there's not going to be communication of the ventricular system because something is obstructing this to reach here. So that would be uh, a, a non-communicating hydrocephalus. If someone has hemorrhage or infection, the ventricular system is all communicated except the reabsorption. So that's the non-communicating, the communicating versus the non-communicating. Okay. Yeah. No. Okay. So non-communicating. <laughs> means that the ventricular system, the CSF is produced here, has to go through here and exit. If it's blocked here, spinal fluid will not leave and reabsorb. So it's non-communicating hydrocephalus. So it's blocked. Communicating hydrocephalus means that the CSF produced here can reach up here to the granulations but can't be reabsorbed. Okay. So that is communicating in the ventricular system, but not draining properly, OK? And that term is an old term. It doesn't really make a difference in how we treat them. Uh, it, it makes more of how we're going to place the catheter and everything. Um, this is the problem that usually happens, acute hydrocephalus. Um, this is where the CSF gets blocked. Um, again, from hemorrhage, uh, infection, and the patients start having headache, nausea, vomiting, and they can get confusion, agitation, somnolence, and that's when they go to sleep permanently. So this is something to keep an eye on. Any, anybody has a brain tumor, any type of neurosurgical cranial procedure, if you start having these symptoms, the headache, the nausea, it's getting worse in confusion, you, you, you should start be calling us here before the patient goes into confusion to make sure do you need a CAT scan. Because that's how you diagnose them. CAT scan. Here, um, and, and this picture is a good one. These are this is ventricle megaly. This these are the, the ventricular system is enlarged. This is the uh, occipital horns. Temporal horn is here. This is the third ventricle. And in this patient, there is a tumor. Um, so in this patient, all these other ventricles are big except the fourth ventricle. So this is a non-communicating hydrocephalus because it's blocked in the ventricular system. The reabsorption in this patient is normal, but this tumor is blocking the exit of spinal fluid. This patient has a non-communicating hydrocephalus. And again, this patient, nausea, vomiting, and then vom and that's when you have to start calling us before they go into sudden death. Um, chronic hydrocephalus, uh, everybody's heard of the the patients who have uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus that uh, went wild and wacky, the older patients who are losing urine incontinence, 